Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marcus. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are in a series entitled Dirt. All right. Turn to your neighbor and say, get out of the dirt. The title of this morning's message is The Battle is in the dirt. The battle is in the dirt. Can you say that with me? The battle is in the dirt. It really is. The battle is in the dirt. We'll talk about that here in just a couple of minutes. A farmer was called to preach. What was that? Oh, okay. A farmer was called to preach. And so while he was out there on his farm, he noticed a cloud in the form of two letters, P and C. And so he decides that those letters meant to him preach Christ. So he sells the farm and he goes out and preaches, becomes a a pastor and evangelist. And he's preaching in a local church and he's horrible. (laughs) He's a horrible preacher. Little Johnny happens to walk into his church and he's hearing him preach in a very, very horrible way. And he's telling this story about how he was called to preach. And little Johnny tells him after the service, he goes, sir, he goes, do you mind if I talk to you for a second? He goes, no, sir. He goes, don't you think that those two letters, P and C, they didn't really mean preach Christ. It actually meant plant corn. (laughs) But that's kid. So we are in a series entitled Dirt. And um, we're talking about the parable of the sower that we find in Mark's gospel, the fourth chapter. You actually should have some notes there on your app, and we'll take a look at this. And like I said last week, or little Johnny said last week, don't let these teachings go in one ear and out the utter, okay? (laughs) Uh, I think these principles are absolutely amazing. And here's some of the things that we all have in common. We all came from the dirt. We are all gonna wind up in the dirt. And from now until then, we have to contend and do battle in the dirt. Isn't that the truth? We constantly have to look at those things in reality and just really look at them at face value and make adjustments in our life. Here's what I know about this morning's message. I love it. Man, I I literally had a dream about it early in the week of what was going to be communicated. And uh, I think it's going to be absolutely amazing for all of you. And so, so this message, though, is if you embrace its teaching, if you hold fast to the truth that we'll find in the scripture today, I think it's going to help you. It's, it's, it's the key to why some people rise and other people fall. It's the, it's the key to why some folks walk in victory or they'll constantly revolve themselves in the agony of defeat. Now, it's simple. It's so simple that you just, just lay it to the side. You'll miss it. You'll actually see this principle in Genesis, which is, is the law. They have this principle in theology called the law of first mention. If you see a principle in the Genesis, you'll see, you'll see it throughout the whole scripture. It's something that you need to hold fast to and hold on to. Here's the thing about all of us. We all have the same farmer, right? We all have the same sower. We all have the same source of seed. We all contend with the same guy called Satan. Now, the fundamental difference between some people rising or falling when it comes to this principle is this, is the condition of the soil and or the understanding of the strategies of Satan. And so this morning, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the strategies of the enemy. And then from here, moving forward, we'll talk about the soil in the next four weeks. Pastor Joel just arrived in Greece yesterday or the day before. He just texted me a while ago. He's like, hey, what time is it over there? He goes, it's 5 p.m. He sends me this beautiful picture. I was like, don't even start. So he'll be back in a couple of weeks, and he's enjoying his time out there. He's probably preaching somewhere. I'm not real sure what he's doing, honestly. He just was nervous about going up there. So you know his phobias that he has. But he made it. He's good. Be praying for him and Emily and Elise, and they'll be back in a little bit. A parable, for those of us who um, are new to our faith, a parable is basically just a, an earthly story with a heavenly mission or a heavenly meaning. Okay, so Jesus is illustrating something that's practical, something that is common to everyone. So whenever he taught, I said last week that he used the agricultural system. He didn't use a social system. Why? Because you can manipulate and take shortcuts in a social system. You can cram for tests. You can, you know, there's people that uh, are in jail that shouldn't be in jail. There's people that are in jail that should be in jail. But you can manipulate all these systems, but you cannot manipulate or take shortcuts when it comes to the agricultural system. 
It's a, it's a proven process and it takes time and it's a process, right? A lot of times we, we sacrifice uh, what's important for the immediate. Why? Because we want to short circuit this process. Well, you we can't do that with the law of the farm. And so it's important for us to get a hold of these principles and the condition of your soil we'll be looking at for the, the next four weeks because you are the soil. You know, when he comes and plants seeds, he's planting seed and how we respond um, to it determine, will reveal to us what's in the soil of our own lives. But the strategies of the enemy is what we have to look at. And I think this will free you, hopefully, this morning. You'll see it all throughout Scripture. Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter, that's where we're at, verses 1. He began to teach by the sea. Anytime you hear the word, he began to teach, and you see that phrase in Scripture in the New Testament, you'll know that Jesus is actually trying to empower people with simple, fundamental principles of faith. Why? Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, right? right. As a matter of fact, whenever he was in his own town, it says that he marveled at their unbelief. And what did he do? It says he began to teach. And so right here, he begins to teach because there's a certain thing that he wants to get fundamentally in the hearers of those of that day. And it's this principle of the law of the farm. It's this whole principle that we're talking about right here. And he goes in and he says, a great multitude was gathered to him. So he got into the boat and he sat in on it at the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. And he taught many things by parables. And he said to them, listen. That word I stopped last week and that was the whole message. So this week, I'm going to go a little bit further and share with you Six more words, okay? <laughs> a sower, he says, behold, a sower went out to sow. That's all we're going to talk about today. A sower went out to sow. In this um, parable, here's what you're going to see. And remember this, okay? You're, you're going to have a sower, you have the seed, you have Satan, and you have the soil. You always have a sower, you always have the seed, you always have Satan to contend with, and you have to look and evaluate the soil. Why? Because the battle is in the soil or the dirt, okay? And so we've got to look at that and just shatter some old thinking. When I first came to Christ, one of the things that uh, he had to instill in my, he had to just reframe my whole image of who God was. So the first thing is, let's take a look at the sower real quick. The sower is Jesus, okay? We all know that. And he comes in to sow uh, his word into our lives. So the sower is Jesus. Matthew 13, it says, he who sows good seed is the son of man. And the image that you and I have to have of the sower is, is that he is always good. Yeah. He's always good. Amen. Everybody can say amen to that. It's like, well, why did God do this? Why did God do He is always good. Always. always. Why is that important? The soil can never say to the sower, you're mean, you're ugly, you hurt, you're unkind, you're unpleasant. It's important that we have the right image of who the sower is. Why? Because the battle is in this dirt. And we have the wrong image. If you have a small God image, you have big problems. If you have a mean God image, you have more confusion, That's right. right? Don't you see that? Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but before I came to Christ, you know, the farmer had, um, he only had one, let me see, what can I use? Man, I should have thought about this. Let me use this guitar. No, I better not use that. <laughs> All he had was one, in my thinking, he had one tool. Mm. It was a pitchfork or a hole or a pickaxe. He's constantly plowing. He's, you know, he's hoeing stuff out of my life. He's pointing things out and just digging it. And he had a shotgun. Poof. He had a shotgun. Because sometimes he didn't use a hole. He didn't use a pickaxe to dig the hole. He just shot it. Then he'd, he'd throw some stuff in there. Stop doing that. Stop doing it. I had an image. I had the wrong image of who the farmer was. I had the wrong image of who the sower was. It was not a good image. Some people still struggle with that today. But the, but the sower is always, always good. Before, before I came to Christ, I always would question, it's like, why do bad things happen to good people? Right? And I realize now my thinking is different because now I realize that there's no one that is good. All have sinned and come short to the glory of God. So my reframing now is, why do good things happen to bad people? Why? Because he's good. 
He is merciful. He is kind. Why do you think that we are blessed because, even though we're so bad? Right. Anybody ever experienced that re- reality? Like, man, this is, I'm undeserving of this, but Lord, you're so good. Do you think you have what you have because you're so awesome? <clears throat> it's only because of the grace and the mercy and the love, loving kindness of my Father. Right? So the image he has to be torn. It's like, well, maybe God caused this. Maybe he did this. No, I always had, I even have an image now of, of my father, not only with the right tools, but now I have it. I understand that he plans and he looks long-term and he right. cultivates and, right. you know, he tills and he, he puts the seed in and he fertilizes it and he waters it and he has gloves on. Not because he didn't want to get dirty, but he just wants to be gentle and care and he understands the condition of that soil and what he needs to do to prepare it so that it can bear fruit. Amen. It's a reframing, and we have to have the right frame that the sower is always good. You have to understand that. Why? I have to say this, that God is not the author of your child prematurely dying. God is not the author. He's not the reason why your husband cheated on you. He's not the reason why, you know, you're still single. He's not the reason why you can't trust crazy church people. He's not not the author of your sickness. He's not the author of your fragment. He's not the author of of the shame. He's not the author of all these things, of your pain and frustrations. He's a good God. Our biggest problem that we have is our view of God, a wrong view of God. You are the byproduct of the God picture that's inside of you. You really are. You're the byproduct of that. Of, of the, uh, every good bit, gift and perfect gift comes from above, yeah. is what the brother of Jesus said. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. When you look at creation, it says, after everything that he created for the benefit of mankind, it said it was good. It was good. It was good. It was just for your benefit. And, uh, until you came to man, he says, it's not good. It's not good that he's alone. So he provides a helpmate. And he that finds a wife finds a good thing, Right? And so, because man can't deal with aloneness. He's like, he goes crazy, does stupid things when he's by himself. (laughs) And all the men said, geez, who is? (laughs) Well, actually, I should say, all the women said, (laughs) yeah, you know that to be true. But so he goes into creation. Oh, taste and see, the psalmist said, that the Lord is good. Nahum says, oh, the Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. He, you got to shatter any idea that the sower, the farmer, is bad. He is good constantly. He wants good things. As a matter of fact, the travel, the, ro- the road that Jesus went on in Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good, Amen. healing all who were oppressed of the devil. I looked at that word in Greek and Hebrew, doing good. You know what it means? Doing good. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, what it means is bestowing benefits. Mm. Psalm 68, bless the Lord who daily loads me with benefits. Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What are some of them? He forgives me of my sin. Amen. He heals me of my diseases. He redeems my life from destruction. He, re- you know, he, he satisfies my mouth with good things. The sower is a good sower. Amen. Amen. You can trust the sower. You can also trust not only the sower, but you can trust the seed. The seed is always good as well. Because what he saw, it says, the benefits and the results of the seed of God's word um, being dropped in your heart will produce good things in your life if you allow it to. It says in Matthew, the 13th chapter, it says, he who sows good seed is the son of man. Isaiah 55 says it this way about the seed. It says, as the rain comes down, man, did you guys love that rain the other day? I was like, I think all the staff, like they they skipped out of work and went outside and just got all wet. (laughs) And and as the rain comes down from heaven and the snow from heaven uh, does not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth a bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. I love this. So he's comparing this beauty, this refreshing, this, this producing uh, uh, 
part, it's a, to the word of God. He goes, it shall not, the word of God shall not return to me void. It will accomplish what I please and it will prosper. It will always produce something. When you look up that word prosper, this is what it means. It will always be a, a good, it will always profit you. It will always advance you. It will always push you forward. Right. <clears throat> in the thing for which I sent it, for you shall go out with joy and be out with peace. So by the time you allow the word of God to come inside of you from the good sower, it will lead you to a place of joy. It will lead you to a place of peace. Yes. Constantly. That's the path. That's the travel. That's the, that's the road that it takes constantly. Over and over and over again. It will not lead you to shame or condemnation. It will lead you to a good place where it produces good things, right? And in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, I think it says it this way. Every scripture has been written by the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. It will empower you by its instruction and correction, giving you the strength to take the right direction and lead you to a deeper path of godliness. So once this seed has been sown in your heart, it will lead you to a better place of discipline and to a better place where you will live a fruitful and godly life. Amen. Right? Oh, it just will. It, 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 it goes in there and it highlights the things that probably shouldn't be there, but he's not in there shaming you. He's wanting you to address it. That's why I said last week, it's important what you hear in the dirt. And how you hear and how you respond to what's taking place when you are in that mess. He's just wanting to cultivate some things. He wants to shatter some old thinking, some bad thinking. And so when he drops this seed, it has a place to have deep roots and grow and produce in your life and in your marriage, in your business, in whatever context you want to put it in. That's, That's the word of God. Amen. Amen. I just went to a mass the other day and I loved the favorite part of my uh, the mass when I was growing up was, this is the word of the Lord. And we would say, a bunch of Catholics in this place. <laughs> now, I know this is basic truth. Pastor Marcus, come on. I took, got up early in the morning, took a shower to come and hear this basic truth. Why am I sharing this basic truth? Here's why I want to eliminate the excuses. Amen. Amen. Because when I approach this teaching, I approach it as if though none of us know anything. I have to approach it that way because we have a whole new group of flock that has just come in here. And so this is fundamental. And you really only hear, if you really get it, we used to have an instructor that say, Marcus, if it's old to you, it's not real to you. But if it's real to you, I don't care how many times you hear it, you embrace it because it's working in your life. And so, so it's just another, another angle I'm going to take is that not only is God the sower good, but, he, but the seed that he sows is also good. Because one of the things that I constantly hear is the excuse, I tried God. I tried the sower. I tried the word of God. You can't try God. You can't try the word of God. God's not on trial. You are. And in the middle of your trial, you're just trying to get out of the trial. And in the middle of the dirt of your trial, God wants to speak to you and say, here's what I want you to get out of your trial. Well, we just want to get out. So, so, so let's just shatter that. Please get this message and just tell your husband and your wife, or you know what? Just tell yourself that God is good and the seed that he's given me is good. It's all has to do with the condition of my soil and whether I understand um, the strategy that the enemy is trying to pull on me right now. Okay? We'll take a look at that. Are you guys with me? Yeah. All right. So if he's good, the sower's good, what's left? Satan and the soil. Let's talk about Satan's strategy. Look at what it says right here in verse 14. It says that the sower sows the word when Jesus is over here trying to um, explain what this parable means. He says the sower sows the word and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear Satan immediately comes or comes immediately. I've got dyslexic. Satan immediately comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Notice immediately he comes in. We have Satan. We have a common enemy. His name is Satan. And his whole strategy is to abort the process of the law of the farm. Yeah. He wants to abort it. He does not want, you know, he might allow that seed to be sown, but he doesn't want it uh, to manifest. And I, I told you guys last week, if you think about what a seed does, if the seed has an outer casing. And that outer casing represents our outer casing. 
And the only way this, every, side, every seed has a blueprint inside of it is a design blueprint that God the Father put himself in there. He put inside of it. It's going it's to accomplish what he purposed it to accomplish. Good. And so anytime you, 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 you uh, are reading God's word and like there's an invitation there, it's like, oh, I wonder what that means or I wonder what that is. It's the spirit of God. To me, it's an invitation by the spirit of God to look at that a little bit more closer. And usually what happens, that blueprint, God's design that, that placed in there needs to come out in your life. But that outer casing has to be broken. And so in the dirt, you hear his voice, you make your adjustments. And a lot of times the outer casing of the things of your fleshly appetites or whatever these things have to be broken in order for that to water and produce and begin to grow and flourish. Does that make sense? And so that's, what, that's exactly what he's doing right here. He has a strategy. Satan comes, what is he, where does he, how does he come? Immediately to do what? He's a thief, right? Didn't John 10, 10 say the thief comes to kill, steal, and to destroy? That's where we get the word thief. That's where we get the word klepto, kleptomatic. He has a compulsion disorder to steal something. He's got to steal something. Joy, whatever it is. He's constantly doing that. How does he do that? What's his approach? What's his tactic? You know that there's a very, very familiar, there's a road that the enemy travels on. There's a path that's constantly you see in scripture that he travels on. It's a road. You can see it's one road, one one path, one one way he's designed to travel on. And I'm going to share that with you, but I need you to write these three words. The three words I need you to write down is this, wiles, devices, and devil, you can take a picture if you don't have any pen or pencil. We live in a culture where there's no more pencil and writing and note taking. It's like, chick, chick, chick. I found out the more I read from my iPad and more I read digitally, the less I remember. Me too. Me too. Isn't that the truth? Bring your Bibles. I'm going to trash these screens. <laughs> just bring your Bible and some notes. I thought it was a great idea, but it's just, I see the... the Anyways, Ephesians, the sixth chapter, wiles, devices, and devil. <clears throat> First one is wiles. Now, one of the laws of um, studying scripture is you interpret scripture in the light of other scripture. Right. And so whenever you're studying about demonic activity, spiritual warfare, demons, Satan, whatever, you look at the different scriptures and you begin to see a picture. You begin to see a pattern. Just like if you evaluate your lives, you begin to see patterns in your life. If you look at your history, you begin to see patterns in your history of what your dad went through or what your grandparents went through or what your, it goes on, you see patterns. Well, the same way we see patterns in our lives, I see patterns in the enemy's tactics. And so here's what we'll see. The, the first one is Ephesians 6 chapter. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the what? The wiles of the devil. That word wiles is this Greek word methodos. Now, the, the, it's where we get method. It's the methods of the, of the enemy. That's what it seems like. When you look at the basic uh, fundamental um, um, meaning of this word, it's deceit, craft, and trickery. That's what it means. Against the trickery, against the tactics, against the trickery or the craftings of the enemy. When you dig a little bit deeper into that same word, that word means with the road. Interesting. It's with a road or on a road. It's a traveled highway. The enemy travels on one road, one lane, one path. He goes one way. He doesn't have, he didn't have new tricks. He's been doing this in the, in, in the book of Genesis. He did the same thing there. You see some of the same scriptures. As a matter of fact, you see the sower, you see the seed, you see Satan, and you see the soil in the book of Genesis. So my question is, what path is it? What, what, what road is it? What lane? What path is he actually taken? Thank you for asking. It's the second word, devices. And we get this in 2 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Corinth and he's basically talking about forgiveness and unforgiveness and the strategies that the enemy tries to put on us. As a matter of fact, it's, it's unforgiveness is a really, really big cause of why people are stuck in, in life. Um, it's the word where we get the word scandalon. And the word picture of, of having unforgiveness and the root of bitterness and all that, it's a, it's a word picture of an old, you know those old boxes like you would trap animals? Has a stick in a box there? 
and you would put bait there, and they would come in, hit the stick, and they would trap them. That's what that word scandalon. You're just taking the bait. It's exactly what he's trying to do. He's trying to get you to take the bait. But right here, the word devices is where we get this word right here. It's pneuma, or it's actually naima. <clears throat> and that means the mind. The tra he, he travels on a path to your mind constantly. One expositor says that he travels on this path to play mind games in your life. Anybody experience that in life? Yeah. Right? At the end of the service, I'm going to give you an illustration of exactly how he does this. It's the same word that we use in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, where it says that the God of this world has blinded the minds, Nema, of them who do not believe. That's why the apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians, where he says, it's important to cast down imaginations okay. Okay. and all those high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Right. Those thoughts and those things. Why? Because that's the road that he travels on. Every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So now this third word is the word devil. And I've taught this several times here in this church, but I'm going to do it again. Why? Because it's important. It's where we get the word, it's, it's the Greek word diabolos. It's a compound word. Dia means penetration. In other words, you're, you're, and bolos means you're throwing something like a ball or a rock. But you're throwing it in a repetitive action over and over and over and over and over again. And the purpose of it to hit that wall and penetrate through that wall. Make sense? Yeah. And that's exactly what the enemy's doing. Diabolus, that's the word devil. He comes in and he throws this sly or whatever it is that he's feeding you and he's doing it constantly. You're not any good. You're a failure. Nobody wants you. Nobody needs you. You don't need anybody. You're worthless. You're ugly. That's why he left. That's why the second one left. That's why the third one left. You're a loser. Over and over and over to break down the mental capacity to think what God says about you. He breaks you down mentally. He throws these allegations, these accusations, the inner critic rises up, it's stronger, all these threats, all these things, and the mental resistance in your life is just broken down, and then it becomes a stronghold. And you walk in total deception. You get that? He's a dirty devil, isn't he? But we're just exposing that right now. And he's committed, man. He is committed. He's committed more to just banging you and tearing you up more than most, most Christians are committed to withstand. That's true. That's true. That's a bumper sticker right there. $25. <laughs> the building fund. Oh, which, by the way, thank you, guys. The, the, the gentleman came over, matched the funds. You guys made it through. Y'all guys did it. 20,000 was raised. The other 20,000 came in. So I appreciate that very much. But yeah, he constantly does that. He's committed to just tear you up. Now, what is, now we, we understand, that's the strategy right there. You're welcome. But here's what Jesus said about Satan and his strategy. In Luke's gospel, the 10th chapter, he says this. I saw Satan fall like lightning. Behold, I give you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, don't you dare rejoice in that. Don't get all proud. Don't get all puffed up as if though you're something. He says, rejoice this, in this, that your names is written in the Lamb's book of life. Humble yourself. As a matter of fact, Humus, hummus, is part of the ingredient that's in the dirt. And that's where we get the word humility. And so, so, but he says, listen, you don't have to, even though you understand his strategy, you don't have to be afraid of it or him. Just understand it. And know when you start getting those things that are contrary to what I'm telling you, because I'm a good sower and I sow good seed and it wants to produce good results, you can stop that. You can say, that's a lie. They're a lie. And it's hard if not only you're feeding yourself that lie or you're buying into the lie, and then your wife or your husband or your friends also just giving you the same lie. Right, right. 
That's why you just separate yourself from that kind of stuff, toxic people and all that kind of stuff. It's important. Your environments are important. Amen. Right? You want people that will build you up and strengthen you and edify you and, you know, encourage you. If you're living in a toxic situation where you just, I don't know how, you, I don't know how Natalie did it. I was, I was a horrible person before we came to Christ. And if anybody should have left me, she should have beat me over the head, used the shotgun, and done something. But I thank God for the mercy of God and how the God, God's grace and God's power enabled her to stay in that situation when she should have been gone. But he knew the future. And he came and sowed a seed into our hearts that exploded and it's still producing fruit in our lives. Amen. And from now until I leave this earth, it's still going to be producing fruit, but the enemy is constantly trying to bring all these devices to try to discourage you. That's the road he's on. And it's mostly mental. Pastor, how do you do that? I just shut my mind off. Your mind can't think on two things at the same time. That's why I love filling my heart and my mind with music or the word of God. And I just like, I can't think on these things. And the only way not to think about it, I try to not to think about it. And the more I try not to think about it, the more I think about it. So the only way I can overcome it is do it the simple way. Read or worship or sing. Or I speak God's word so that my ear hears it. My ear, my ear hears it. Make sense? So here's my last question. If we know that the sower is good, if we know that the seed is good, and if we understand that the strategy of the enemy is to try to trip you up, and it's the path to your mind, how does he travel to the mind? How does he, what vehicle does he use? Does he ride on the back of a pig? Does he travel in the trees and jump from tree to tree? Does he travel through people to get to you? No, you know how he does it? He slithers through the soil. He slithers through the soil. Mm. <laughs> mm. When I, I heard that in the dream the other night, I woke up. I'm like, OMG, thank you. When you take a look at Genesis, you see that the seed was sown to Adam and Eve. It was beautiful. I created all this for you. This is all good. It's for your benefit. I have connection with you every evening. I'm here empowering you, letting you know that I love you. I've given you my security. I'm not going anywhere. This is your place. I've given you autonomy. You get to <clears throat> build your own kingdom. Go build your own kingdom, man. And so he given them everything. The seed was sown. It was good. And then slithering around was the enemy with his strategy, and he begins to go to the path of the mind of Eve and started making suggestions. It begins to contradict God's word. She buys into it, became fully deceived. Adam didn't do anything. And all of a sudden, they're totally deceived. We're in the mess. And when they found, God found out about it, of course, it's like, not like he didn't know, but he, he found out, he addressed it. He tells that snake, you're going to go back and you're going to slither and slide around, eat the dust. You're going to go back to the dirt. And he's, that's the path he uses, to the dirt. And so the next four weeks, we're going to be dressing the soil and the condition of your soil. And know this, that in every soil, it doesn't matter what soil it is, he's slithering around, trying to make suggestions trying to get you to buy into his strategy, trying to put vices on you, trying to get you to, 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 to make you examine God's word and says, that's not really what he said. This is what he says. Try this. Does that make sense? But we know that he's a defeated foe. Amen. Did you get something out of that? Good. Now listen to this. Put that last one in, that last one. Answer this question. Forget little Johnny, okay? Let's just say a man. A man leaves home running, and he runs a little bit, and he turns left. Little Johnny, he turns left. He runs a little bit more, he turns left. And he runs a little bit more, and he turns left, and he runs back home. And what he sees when he gets home are two masked men there waiting for him. Here's my question. Why did little Johnny leave home running? Why did this man leave home running? And who are the two masked men there? Anybody have any ideas or suggestions? It looks like he was like maybe in danger, right? Like something happened, he took off running, and he takes a left, comes back home, and there's these masked men there. No, 
Think of it this way. Think baseball. Johnny was at a baseball game. He hits a home run. He takes off running, takes left to second base, goes left to third base, comes back home. The two masked men that were there is the umpire who had a mask and the catcher who had a mask. Why am I concluding with this? That's the, how the enemy plays mind games. That's how he, that's what he does. It's subtle, right? And you buy into it. And you're like, you know what? He was in danger. It looks like he was running away. I don't know who these masked men are. And that's, you'll take a cut and create cancer out of it. He'll do all these things, but he is not, we're not ignorant of his devices. We understand the strategy. And my prayer is for us to get that truth embedded in our heart, recognize the things that are going on in our lives and say, no, devil, that's not true. This is my father. He's a good God. He has good seed. It's going to be implanted into my heart and it will produce fruit in my life, in my family's life, in my legacy, in my business, in every aspect. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Let me pray for you. Father, you're so good to us. And we are so thankful that your word is so clear and your word helps us to just become uh, good folks, good families here in this community so we can serve people and love people and love our children and, and help this community, Lord God, grow where they see the character and nature of God. As we pray for this city, your word tells us, Lord God, that more light will come and lives will be changed and transformed because of your word. We trust you. Bless your people, Lord God. I just speak your blessings upon them. May you, prom you promote them. May your favor surround them. May they just, Lord God, just understand and see and experience your goodness this week. In Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said amen. amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next. Oh, man, I forgot about grow groups. Sign up for grow groups. What you see here, you guys, are all the different groups for this semester till the end of the year, right before uh, holidays, that you can get involved in. All right? We'll talk more about it next week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.